anyway, but I think I hope I will make it as an appetizer for the lunch. And those people who want to leave, they can leave early. We are going to continue on the same about uh, HIV patients. So here I have a 47-year-old, a 47-year-old with end-stage renal disease at the age of 25 because of secondary, policy, of secondary to polycystic kidney. He had his first renal transplant in uh, India. It was non-living related in 1992, and it was removed one and a half year later, and he was back to hemodialysis, and at the same time, later on, he was diagnosed to have hepatitis C virus in 1997. He underwent a second non-living related transplant in the 18th of April, 2003. This is the first clue for medical residents, students, that when you put a specific point, you have to remember it. His second renal transplant course was really complicated in Egypt. From the second post-operative day, he was oliguric, and they thought that he has got vascular rejection, and was maintained on hemodialysis until he returned to Saudi Arabia and he came to King Faisal emergency room. His immunosuppressive regime consisted of Rapamune, MMF, prednisolone, and he was also on Gancyclovir and Bactrim prophylaxis. He was afebrile, pulse 85, head and neck examination were negative, cardiac exam were negative, abdomen was soft, there is the transplanted kidney, actually none, none, nothing really rewarding in examination. His investigation showed, of course, he's an end-stage renal disease, but at the same time, his white count was 10, hemoglobin 70, and the platelets was 149. The impression was acute tubular rejection. The patient maintained on hemodialysis. He had kidney biopsy. Actually, he had two kidney biopsies. The first one showed tubular necrosis on the fifth. They repeated it after nine days, and it showed that he has got acute rejection. And the renal, transpl uh, renal scan was done, and it showed uh, perfusion and poorly functional renal transplant consistent with acute rejection. They gave him immunosuppressive treatment. I just want to make sure that it is fine, yes, for the rejection. So during his hospital course, he developed fever, skin rash, and oral thrush. Otherwise, the examination did not reveal the source of his infection. Blood culture and urine culture were negative. His white count was 1, his platelets 53, and his hemoglobin is 70. Now, what is the most likely diagnosis? For the sake of time, you have to be fast and sharp. CMV. How many CMV? Okay. How many HIV? One, two, three. How many EBV? No. How many hemolytic uremic syndrome due to cyclosporin? None. Actually, the majority don't know. I can see. No, no hands. So the patient, what test will you require? What, what, what will you do? CMV antigenemia and viral load? How many? One test only. You are asked to do only one test. What, which one will be of this? Bone marrow. OK. The patient had a bone marrow, and the bone, the bone marrow did not give you any diagnosis. He had, he was, because he was neutropenic, they gave him tazosine, they gave him cefepim, cefep, and they were awaiting the serology tests for CMV, EBV, brucella, syphilis, HIV, and all, which all returned negative. However, his HIV ELISA came back positive. So he was diagnosed as an acute retroviral syndrome, but it was awaiting confirmation by Western plot. His viral load returned to be more than 500,000, and his CD4 92. So what action will you take after counseling? How many will start heart? Hands up. One, two, three, four, five. How many will repeat the test, and if positive, then treat? No need? Repeat? OK. Repeat the test, and if positive, advise that he, he does not require treatment at this stage, because it is an acute retroviral. How many? Very quiet. You are not interactive enough. So on May the 24th, he was started on heart. He was given three drugs. 
And in addition to his immunosuppressive medication at the same time, which consisted of cyclosporin A and prednisolone. His HIV viral load declined to 193 copies in July. Remember, he was started in May. And his CD4 went up to 543. The patient was followed up every three to four months and with regular viral load and CD4. His viral load became undetectable, and his CD4 went up to 1,000. That's good. Yes? It was low. But because, don't forget, he's immunosuppressed. Yes, he's immunosuppressed, and he was taking immunosuppressive medication. Yes, and his white blood cell count was even low. Always remember the CD4 go with the white blood cell count. In October 2010, seven years later, the patient was re reconsidered for a serenal transplant in our hospital. And the transplant workup included HIV antibody test, and it was negative. Okay. So, no one, no one kept, no one bothered about it. So one year later, he was readmitted, and when he was readmitted for revascularization insertion of an access, we repeated the test, and it was also negative. Yes. He is on treatment. He's taking antiretroviral, and I'm talking not viral load. I'm talking about antibody. So why is he HIV negative? Is it zero reversion? Is it zero deconversion? Is it a test error? Is it a false positive ELISA? Is it that his waning immune system that he went into advanced AIDS? Or is it that he lost his passive transfer antibodies? So which one? Lahza. So al Saab? Is it? Come on. Batul, is it difficult? What? It is difficult. It is? Is it? Yes. Okay, and then if it is difficult, I will pass. Yes. Okay. So, did you hear what he said? One. Okay. So, what he said is what he said, he said that he feels that the patient was treated, that's why his antibody became low. And so, this is what we call zero deconversion. The zero deconversion, why is it zero deconversion? Because we gave him treatment. If it is without treatment, we call it zero reversion. Fadali. Uh, you want to learn? This is too much. Exactly. But you see, let me tell you. Seeing is believing, sir. Huh? And seeing is believing. When you see something, you believe it. And so when you believe it, you learn from it. And when you learn from it, you teach other people about it. No, I will tell you. Where is the, I will tell you the catch. You are right. Because how many of you here treat HIV? Raise up your hands. OK. How many of you, when you are treating HIV, you repeat the HIV antibody? OK, so you don't know. So you don't know. Yes. Yes. So what test will you request now? Yes. HIV viral load, undetectable. The provirus DNA, you request. OK. Will you request CCR5 gene? Will you request the Western plot? OK. Now, what, what I did, the patient was tested, and he had no 32 base pair deletion in the CCR5 gene. What do I mean by that? I felt that this patient. Maybe we saw him very early. He was exposed to the virus. 
just like the patient they, they spoke about, the, the German patient, the German patient or the Berlin patient, he doesn't have CCR5. That's why he, did, he lost his HIV. So we did that gene test, it came back. He's not, he's negative. Western plot was undetermined. The provirus DNA was negative. So during counseling the patient, confirmed that, he said, you know what? I used to go to Medina, and I'm dialyzed in Medina, and since 2005, they said to me, you are HIV negative. And he said, no, I am HIV positive. I am treating in King Faisal, and they told me that you are positive. I don't believe you. And let me be dialyzed in my own machine. Don't put me with the other patients. And so they continued. So the question will, will you stop his heart? Who are you? <laughs> yes. Yes. Who are you? Say no. You see, we have a patient here. I did. So you will say to me, no, I have to counsel the patient. You have to say, I would like to counsel the patient. Why do we take decisions for patients? Why? We should go and sit with the patient. So I went. You know, we don't, we should not, we should not delay the lunch, sir. Okay, come on. So I went, I went and I counseled the patient. And I said to him, look, this is what is happening. Do you mind stopping the drug? And he said, I would love that. You know what? It is causing pins and needles in my hands and feet. So I said, look, I'm going to take a decision here. I will stop your medication, and I don't know what will happen to you after I stop it. I will stop it for a therapeutic trial. This is what I would do. Maybe. I'll tell you, I'll stop it and check your viral load after two months. Okay. Because I'm again, then I have a case. Okay. If you promise me you are not going to leave the auditorium for the second case and the chairman can allow me, then I will take my time here. <laughs> you see, okay. So we stopped his heart on the 1st of November 2011, and we tested him every six weeks and his HIV remained negative. So we felt, to our knowledge, this is the first reported case of post-renal transplant who was cured from HIV. And to be honest, I was so happy. And I'm still happy. It is amazing, yes? yes. It is unbelievable. Yeah. So it is more than the cases which Hoda said that you would never see. Yes. <laughs> yes. What? A case report? The recent case report. Yes, yes, but look, how can I report the case? The patient was not mine, and the primary physician said, you are not going to report this case. You have to wait, and I have to wait. I have to follow. Mashallah, if I were to go to all our HIV positive patients that achieved a zero viral load until the virus therapy and check their HIV antibodies, if 5% are negative, then I would give you a, I could credit to this. But if not, if all of them are positive, then I would question. Ya Nizar. That's my opinion. Nizar, you have to give me more time. <laughs> and I'm not in charge. Tariq is in charge. Uh, they stop this, uh, this monopoly. <laughs> so what happened to the patient? So we stopped it, and he did very well. OK, I'm going back, sir. OK. So let us tell you something. I spoke about it. What is zero reversion and zero deconversion? OK, so we told about zero deconversion. It means that we gave the medication and he zero deconverted. OK? Now, HIV zero reversion and zero negativity. The potential causes are loss of passively transfer, they, they from mother to child. They, the, the baby will be positive, and then he lose it. And then it could be a test error. It could be a false positive ELISA followed by a negative ELISA test. So it might be. Or, as we said, the waning immunity. Potential causes of HIV seronegativity is in the window period, he can still be negative. And the same is the other thing. What about seroDeconversion? There are some reported cases of seroDeconversion. And the first time was when the people used interferon in the treatment of that. There were also two reports cases of shown that the first time that patient with acute early HIV may lose their antibodies. So, and then there is the therapeutic AIDS vaccine. So you always, when you see something like this, you go to the literature and you try to see and you will find all this in the literature. So, did our patient seroDevert or seroDeconvert? I had a lot of challenge, even in the hospital. They said it was wrong. He was not even HIV from the beginning, but 
no, he was HIV. Because his viral load was more than 500,000. And at that time, we were just getting levels more than 500,000. We didn't use to have the millions and the two millions. And then what? We repeated it after three months. It did not disappear. He had 193, which was the effect of the treatment. So no one can say, no, he was not HIV. Are you all convinced? OK. So how did he acquire HIV? We always ask ourselves, how did he acquire HIV? He acquired it from his renal transplant. And from the renal transplant, there are two mechanisms that you can acquire HIV from. When they take the kidney itself, they wash it. But still, sometimes there are drops of bloods which are there. So he can get that. The other thing, he can have blood transfusions and all products during that. We couldn't get that history. And he, when we asked him, he said, I don't remember. I don't know even if they gave me blood at that time or not. So I'm sure all of you now are going to think of Reham. What about HIV and core receptors? This is what we did. It is the core receptors that the patient who don't have it, they don't acquire the disease. So we ruled it out in our patient. So why did our patient COD convert? Is it the early treatment? Is it the use of cyclosporin, the use of sacrolimus, the MMF, or the immunoglobulins? Is he cured? Is it functional, or is it a sterilization? So you will go and you will find that during acute antiretroviral, they used, the people used to use this treatment and they found that they were following them up. And some patients, they did use half CRD conversion. So I want to cut it short, this case, to tell you that when you go into the literature, you will find a lot of these things. And when I put the mechanism, you will be amazed about the role of cyclosporin. Cyclosporin has got an antiretroviral effect. The role of MMF, it has got a role of of antiretroviral effect. And not only that, they have got role in the immune system in the effect of the CD4s and the cytotoxic T cells. So all this play a role. And even you will find that there were studies that patients tried to use MMF in patients with acute retroviral to give them. And so when they give it to them with antiretroviral, they seroconvert it, but when they stopped, they rebounded. Okay? So Yes. Oh, really? So will our patient rebound? You see, unfortunately, our patient rebounded after six months. Here, he rebounded after six months. And that's why we did not report the case. Although I discussed it in the US, I discussed it with, in the UK, I discussed it with a lot of authorities, and they felt even now we still have to report the case. But he rebounded after six months. So he was another one which you could say he had functional cure or a sterilization. But the point I want to mention is in the conclusion that there is very important practical points, including infection control. Sorry? The marker, the viral load came up, the antibody came back. He had the positive antibody and the viral load. Now, this brings to you a, a very important point. When you are taking organs from transplant donors, don't test them long before the transplant. Test them before the transplant within two weeks. Plus, now, a lot of us are treating patients, and now we don't test their antibodies. So maybe HIV treated patients. They might lose their antibodies, and they may go and donate blood, and it might be negative. They might go, and they want to donate their organs, and they are negative. So you always have to be very careful about that. Now, this patient, if he did not insist that he is HIV, and he went to the dialysis center, and he was dialyzed with the other machines, I think he would have spread the disease. I will go to the second case. <laughs> شفتوا ما أنا المتأخر وبعدين أعطاني 40 minutes وبيتكلم معي في التلفون وعايزين two cases و 40 minutes وبعدين يجي يقول لي كنترول من وين هو محمد قطب من ناحية والتشيرمنز من ناحية أخرى anyway now the second case please be interactive or otherwise you are going to spoil it he is a Sudanese guy And I will have to go very quick and fast. A fascinating case. A fever of unknown origin. So he's a 52-year-old Sudanese gentleman who's married his housekeeper in our hospital. He's a known case of sickle cell trait. He's hypertensive, and he's a smoker. 
He had night fever, weight loss, headache for six days, and temperature when he first presented to the emergency room. They told him, you have got chronic fever. They reassured him and come back to the ER if you have another fever. The night fever became for seven days. He lost his appetite. He started losing weight. He developed backache. They did brucella titer and a chest x-ray, which were not conclusive. Still continued to have all the symptoms. He, they thought he is hypothyroid. Up to now, we were not yet involved. So in the 19th of October, with the same mild pyrexia and assessment of FUO and weight loss, weight loss they thought he has got cancer. So they did an ultrasound, chest x-ray, all these things, and nothing happened. So two days later, he came with weakness and loss of appetite. They told him, you have got diabetes. They started him on oral hypoglycemic, a real case. It happens everywhere. So in summary, by the 21st of October, he has fever for four weeks, and which was mainly at night, weight loss, decreased appetite, headache, generalized fatigue, and backache. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it falciparum malaria, typhoid, TB, brucella, or malignancy? TB. How many TB? Good. How many brucella? OK. How many malignancy? OK. So what happened next? What happened next, he presented with on and off confusion, behavior changes, and headache. And he had loss of appetite and weight loss, night fever, urinary incontinence. He had the fever. He was drowsy disoriented, CNS, no focal deficit. So what did they do? What will you do next? Chest x-ray, CT brain, lumbar puncture, malaria film, or blood culture? CT brain. He had the CT brain, and the CT brain showed multiple ring-enhancing lesions consistent with brain abscess. But the radiologist said, this is malignancy. This patient, Lure, he has got malignancy in the chest. Now, you know this is the, the, new, the new radiologist. They do a CT brain, they tell you he has got malignancy in the chest. You do a CT chest, they tell you he has got pneumonia. And it is not pneumonia, he tell you it is fungus. He gives, he gives you a microbiological diagnosis. His white blood cells and all these things were not really conclusive to tell us what we are happening. So what will be your next test? A PPD skin test, chest x-ray, sputum for AFB, sputum for cytology, LP, serology, or CT chest. Go simple. OK, CT chest. But before the CT chest, we did this chest x-ray. Can anyone tell what is abnormal in this chest x-ray? He's what? Tilted. Yes, the patient is tilted. So this is the diagnosis. Tilted patient causing FUO. So a 52-year-old male with one month's history, and this is it. So what would we do next? This is his CT scan. The patient was admitted under neurosurgery. They started him on dexamethasone. I will pass that. Now, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it TB brain abscess, toxoplasma encephalitis, non-tuberculous TB brain abscess, CNS primary lymphoma, metastatic brain lesion, cryptococcoma, or brucella? You see the question. Is he HIV positive? No, he's HIV negative. So the most likely thing is TB. Very good. What next? We did the chest, chest x-ray, CT chest. What does the CT show? Liver. The liver. Look at this liver. Liver abscess. So the man has liver abscess. So when the man has liver abscess, what does the neurosurgeon do? The neurosurgeon say, I'm not going to do any surgery on him. So call ID. So they called the ID, and we came. Sickle cell trait, this is the summary. So nothing new. So why multiple lesions? What? Just a mildly raised alkaline phosphatase. But the chest x-ray I showed you showed the high diaphragm. OK? So he has got multiple. One minute? OK. It is an infectious process. Why is having brain abscess and a liver abscess? OK? So we came, the ID, and as usual, we were asking, and we asked so many questions. Do you have any bowel disease, perianal, this thing? What was the test which is missing? A patient with six weeks history of fever. What is the first test you residents do? Blood culture. So we said, how come this patient for six weeks no one does a blood culture? Actually, no one did it. So when they did the blood culture, the blood culture came back positive, And it was strep veridans. So he had strep veridans in the blood. 
So with the strep viridans in the blood, and he has got this, so it is endocarditis. Okay, so how will you treat him? Medically, surgically, or drained ultrasound? So he went under ultrasound, they drained 800 cc of pus, which grow strep viridans. His echinococcus was negative, schistosoma negative, he didn't have malaria, PPD was negative, all these things you are asking for were negative. So the blood cultures even repeated were positive, so it is more likely endocarditis. And it was very dense. So after the abscess drage, he became tachypnic. Did he desaturate? No. What did he happen? He had a pneumothorax. So from the pneumothorax, he were, so five days later after the pneumothorax, the chest tube was, was done, he became hypotensive, and now he desaturated. Why does he saturate? He developed pulmonary edema, a pulmonary embolus. Uh-uh, this Sudanese guy is driving me crazy. He's going from one complication to the other. And this is his PE. So massive pulmonary PE, he was started on anticoagulation. If he had endocarditis, will you give him anticoagulation? Yes, you are worried about the cerebral bleeding. So what they gave him, the Clexan, and we said, anticoagulation, is it safe or not safe? So what will you do? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm Alish, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, this patient, and I will tell you, I'm sorry, but this is what is happening, is that we did an echo, it was negative, transesophageal echo, we requested a single test. We requested him to have a bubble test to prove that he has got patent foramen ovale and he had a patent for a valley. Now, why did he develop the brain, the liver? So we did a colonoscopy, he has got diverticular disease. So it is diverticulitis, complete, complicated by portal pyemia, liver abscess, through the foramen valley, it went to the brain. And so, this is just how I want to show you, is that.